Hello, everybody. Thank you. This is Samantha. Hello. This is Jennifer. Hello. And we make our great team. Because we're both goddesses. <laughs> so we're both heavily into mythology and have studied it independent. So we are, most people get, oh, you're amateur myth, uh, historians, amateur mythologists. I have a degree in history. I'm you have a degree in history. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't have an amateur. So you're a professional when it comes to this stuff, and I say as an amateur, but I almost went for a mythology um, master's degree instead of a creative writing degree. So. And I was very jealous. And you also need to know. I did. Yeah. I actually got accepted to a PhD program to study mythological studies. Really which really made me jealous. want to do that. Yes, yes. yes. I was going to join her. So we are going to talk about mythology, mythological goddesses, but as it relates to fiction, it's not really about putting any mythological framework in your story, any mythological pieces in your story, because your characters, what it really relates to is archetypes. Um, we're also going to talk about representations of the goddess and maybe how that needs to change in the future. Um, so we're going to talk first about goddesses as archetypes and what that means. There are also gods as archetypes, but we're not covering them today. Yeah. Although we will compare some of them with some of the um, more obscure goddesses that we talk about. So the first one is Aphrodite. And I'm gonna go through these slides a little quickly because really this is this is really just about setting up your archetype. Um, and uh, the book that most of this information comes from is a really great book called 45 Master Characters. Um, if you don't have it, you should. If you have, if you do any character, characters are not my strong suit. I'm a world building girl. Who's it called? Uh, 45 Minutes for Characters, Victoria Lynn Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T, Mythic Models for Creating Original Characters. So not only does it go through the most popular um, characters, male and female, in creating heroes and villains, um, but it also um, takes you through the feminine and masculine journeys, which we're also going to talk about too, and the, and the differences between those journeys and societal and gender differences between the journeys. Um, and you will see, if you look up archetypes, you just do a search for uh, archetypes in fiction, you're going to see these descriptions over and over and over again. The seductive muse, the femme fatale. So basically, each of the goddesses and the gods have two sides to them. Um, if you study real mythology, a lot of the gods and goddesses have more than two sides. Like Isis is known for having four sides to her. Um, but as far as archetypes go, they'll do two. So one is generally the, the good side, and the other one is the bad side of the side. And they seem so. to sort of be the extremes. Yes, um, and these lists are not all encompassing, so there are more things that you can, um, you can go deeper into your character. And one good way to use it is to make it make your character more complex. So with the, with the good side, there's always assets and flaws. Um, the bad side tends to be all flaws. <laughs> Although, it depends on how but you But you could use it, come, if you were writing the femme fatale, the save the cat moment was gonna come from the good side. So if you don't know save the cat, save the cat is when you have the evil villain who is bent on destroying the world, but he will still stop to save a little box of kittens that he sees on the side of the road, and like, Mr. Fluffles, you have the save the cat moment. Nobody is ever absolute pure evil. Um, for an example for that, there is, and it's a haunting photo of Hitler going for a walk, and there's a little innocent girl holding his hand, and he's just guiding this little girl along. So even Hitler, as much as you don't want to say it, not absolute evil, because he still holds the hand of a little girl. So, um, But what this does is these, this bad side of this character matches this. Complementary. It's complementary. So so you really don't need a lot of explanation for somebody who is this character to have some of these traits. And you will find most well-written characters are a mix of several different types of people. And what's really fun to do is there's quizzes all over 
online, um, which archetype are you? And, and to, it'll give you a list, and you think, oh, I'm, I'm this one thing, and you look at the list, you're like, I'm not that at all. I thought I would be a nurturer character. Like, nothing. I like nothing nurturer. There's maybe one. <laughs> one trait that is the nurturer that I possess. I'm like, oh, I'm not a nurturer. I'm a father's daughter. Well, I turn out to be a Hufflepuff. <laughs> I refuse to take that because I'm afraid I'm going to be a Slytherin. <laughs> so, um, Aphrodite, we have, you know, her, if you're the seductive muse, um, you, you're smart, creative, emotional, joy sex, you know, we all see this, this kind of character. The bad side of this is manipulative, unfaithful, um, great actors, not that they a bad thing, but it's too many Billy people is really why. Um, has to be the center of attention. And you'll see some of them are, are like this, loves to be the center of attention. That's an asset for her. Must be the center of attention. It's not an asset for this side of that character. So if you're going to be fast, you're going to be fast. <laughs> um, these are examples. Yamaha, Bovary, Madame Bovary, Scarlet Harry, Don Quinn, Ginger, and Gilligan's Island. These are just a couple of things. Um, Artemis. I read there's a whole article. There's a, there's a website called J's, J-S-T-O-R. And it's for journal, journalism. And they say, yeah. So there's an article on there. And you, you have to join to be able to see the articles. but. Um, if you're it's free. The university system. Yeah. Uh, or some libraries, uh, city libraries. Apply yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's an article on there by Heidi Strangel, Strangel called "You Can't Kill the Goddess: Figures of the Goddess Artemis in Stephen King's Fiction." So this is a whole article on how Stephen King uses the goddess Artemis in his in his writing. It's a very cool article. Um, so you have the Amazon and the Gorgon. So, you know, loves animal nature, being able to fight, can't think of anybody like that in recent movies. Um, bad side can be irrational and boastful, may take on an aggressor's trait in order to beat them, right? Um, but then the bad side shows no remorse, dictator like, will sacrifice herself to win, aggressive, erratic, irritable, reactive. And it's the, for Artemis specifically, there's the light side of the moon and the dark side of the moon. And so yeah, you have the, the Amazon, the Gorgon, but Artemis also had, that she was known as Artemis when she was the loving, caring, nurturing, virtual goddess, and Hecate when she was the dark side, the evil, the, the goddess of witches and witchcraft and sorcery. And, um, and there was some debate of whether or not they were actually worshiped as two separate goddesses or really were one single goddess, but they recognized almost two souls within a single body, so. And you see, um, I don't know. Katniss ever being in Hunger Games. Annie Hill, it's a misery, so I pulled that from this one. Um, she, he also talks about, it was really interesting, um, in Carrie, the gym teacher is the Artemis character, where she fiercely defends Carrie from the other girls and nurtures her, you know, so that we have that nurturing part of her as, as well as the warrior part of her. Um, so she's on an excellent. She also has a whole of these kids though sometimes. Right, right. So she has <coughs> features of her so organ mean, side, you know. right? Artemis was fiercely protective of her virgin beings. If you were a virgin being sworn to Artemis, she was fiercely protective of you. You had sex, even to a degree if you were raped and had sex, be gone from my sight now. She turned on you that quick. She only was faithful to them as long as they were true. So there was the dark side. So you see that within fiction of, oh yeah, I'll be kind of nurturing to you until you step out of life, until something happens where you are no longer valued to me. Yeah. And, um, and you know, the Roman side of um, Artemis is Diana, which, was, which is funny because the island that they were on is nearly a Greek island. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> we have Athena, father's daughter. Values, work, and career, self reliant, smart, intellectual. I don't follow the confidence, I'm sure. Uh, I used to be an avid supporter of patriarchy until this year. <laughs> Workaholic, definitely. <clears throat> don't often express it from the inside. You do. 
<laughs> uh, the bad type of being, not just the backstabber. Um, and it's most, and a lot of a lot of this comes from feeling trapped. She, feeling trapped, she's detached, she's manipulative. So therefore, she's thinking of herself first. She wants to get to you before you get to her. Can destroy others before they get to her. And um, it's almost the overemphasis on the intellect, on the mind. To rejecting the sexuality aspect that you see from Athena, to rejecting the kind nurturing that you would see from Artemis and other goddesses. Athena is all about mind and intellect to the point that, oh yeah, she'll destroy you. She'll just, she's she's, she knows how. Yeah. So she's smart and she knows it. Kate and Sandy is true, and Beth and Percy Jackson, who was her daughter. Um, and Clarice, sorry, sometimes. I think a much more um, subtle. Yeah. Athena. Clarice. Where you see that she was so more gentle. She was, I you, you see where she, she understands I need to back off a little bit in order to manipulate. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, very smart, very capable of sitting down with the evil and getting what she needs. Demeter had to give her daughter to Hades. He only gets her back part of the year. So we have the nurturer who clearly didn't want to give up her daughter. He wants to help him. She's Mother Earth, you know. She worries about those in her care. Um, great listener, generous. Other side of her is um, the, 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 the flaw is that she worries about those in her care to the point that she can smother them. Um, so she can't, you know, to the point that the Earth is dying and Zeus has to step in and say, okay, sure, I'll, I will decree that your daughter cannot be with her husband for a certain amount of time of the year because she needs to be with you, otherwise you will let the earth die. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. And then she also needs somebody to take care of her. So she can, um, she can, she's manipulative too, just like um, some of the other ones too. Uh, and you'll see a pattern emerging here. Um, um, She's manip so it doesn't even say manipulative here, but all of that is manipulative, um, and we've seen manipulative before. Um, so this is a, a trend in female figures. This is how they gain their power because they cannot physically have power over men. So they use other things. They use their intellect. They use their guilt tripping. <laughs> Um, well, it's the, it's the women can't go to war. We can't take up swords and shields and we can't go fight. We're not strong as a man. And it's almost, strangely enough, you would think not, that we're not smart enough to take a man on head to head. So we've got to go behind the scenes and we've got to manipulate. But manipulation is a sign of intellect. So the fact that you're saying we can't face a man head on because we're not smart enough, so we have to manipulate them. So we're smart enough to manipulate a man, but we're not, what? So you see those weird clashes of, did you hear what you just said, and how that does not make sense. It comes up over and over again. But that's where your lack of self-confidence comes in, and that's another thing you'll see. Um, not, I didn't necessarily put it in everyone, but that's another uh, trend you'll see in, in the goddess figures, is a lack of self-confidence or a lack of self-reliance, um, need someone to care for her, that kind of thing. And the fact that these same traits are coming up across the different types of archetypes is showing how women are being viewed. Our negative traits are that we're manipulative, that we're over needy, that we're doing these sort of things. Whereas when you look at some of the male archetypes, you don't constantly see the same negative, oh, manipulative, manipulative, manipulative. No, it's usually like too aggressive. Or too see, right, well, the, and uh, well, we'll go. Was through. Artemis, I'm trying to remember now, was Artemis also in that theme as manipulative too? Or? She, she can be. Mm -hmm. She can be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They all, and they all can, they all focus on like, we're coming from very patriarchal cultures where yeah, you've got all these different gods and goddesses, but the constant theme is coming back to, a good woman is not manipulative. A good woman does these it's things. It's a great listener and generous. Yeah, stays home, cares for others and herself. So, for, what was, it, what was that we were just talking about? For Peter? Yeah, very well. Probably sleep, and beauty. Um, Belle. 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 Oh, is that you? you did oh, that no, I just said you. Well, it is you. Belle, you're right. Belle. Did you do that? Sorry. I tried to hold the Uh, Hera. Um, 
wife to Zeus, right? Queen of the universe, right? Magia. Uh, her bad side is the scorned woman. She loves to spend time with her family, committed to her marriage, even though he wasn't. Um, decisive leader. If, they, if she does not have a family, she'll run her business like a family. Um, very close knit. Um, but dependent and can be obsessive, keeps problems hidden, so she always looks like she's still in control. May have suicidal tendencies, irritable, and Passive aggressive? Oh, passive yeah. Aggressive. We, we know passive aggressive. Yeah, oh, yeah. my husband went and had an affair, and now there's yeah. a couple of legitimate children. I won't strike out at him. I'll strike out at his lover. The snakes in the bed. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Transforming and doing Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we do the examples for that. Jean Grey. Next man, Miss Bennett, uh, Miss Bennett, Prime Prejudice, Joan Crawford, Monteers. Okay, Hestia, Mystic. <laughs> um, that's a good thing about um, researching goddesses. <laughs> Best pictures, man. <laughs> it's just gorgeous pictures. Another thing we'll touch on. on. Yeah. <laughs> There is a good and a bad side to that. Mm -hmm. um, we have the mystic, all those things that that evokes, you know, the artist side, calm, gentle, creative. Um, but, you know, there's bad sides to artists. We're all artists, so we can confess to those. Shy, timid, unable to be assertive. Hmm, I wonder what that describes. Flighty, right here. Yeah, flighty. Um, we don't know how to have fun. I think yeah, that's not a problem we have. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe not fun like everybody else thinks of. <laughs> but we have prone to mental illness. That happens in artists a lot. Socially inept. <laughs> Prefers to be alone. Fears rejection. We are all fears rejection. <laughs> and a lot of that, a lot of that comes from the different way we look at the world. We see the world for all of its beauties and all of its joys. It's sort of looking at, we see the divine light and it's driving us mad. Um, but this one always jars me because I don't think of the opposite of a mystic as a betrayer. You know, it's hard to think. Like, even at, at my worst, I don't think that I fit a betrayer. You know, so um, but, yeah. Just because she thinks of herself first, she feels trapped. So anybody who feels trapped is going to think of themselves first. They have to get out of the situation, um, and they will do anything to get out. Again, you see that. Look, that's more the mystic. <laughs> <laughs> Grandmother and flowers in the attic. Now she's the betrayer. Um, Fee, Faye, and friend. <laughs> so we have um, when you go to the male, just the, just no, the male. So the male side of like the god equivalent to that would be Poseidon, the artist, and the abuser. So we have the artists love to create and change things, can be great creative works, full of passion and intensity, loves family and friends, very street smart as opposed to book smart. Strange for an artist. Right. Um, flaws, expresses himself without regard to feelings of others, has trouble controlling emotions, invades other people's boundaries. So very similar things to the female side. Um, the villainous side is the abuser, beats his wife and then brings her flowers to apologize. Irritable, unpredictable, plays head games, driven to revenge, will hold a grudge for years. So very similar, um, but the language is different for how we describe that from the goddess. Um, goddess portrays a, a man, the woman abuses, or the man, the man abuses, abuses a woman. woman. And it's different. To betray is very, it's more the emotional aspect. I betrayed your love. You put your faith in me and I went and cheated on you. The man comes home and leaves his Physical. wife. Or yeah. mental. Or mental. Two ways. It's, it's, it's the aggressor. Um, as a betrayer, you are the passive side of that. You, again, have to get around a different way. Um, okay. Isis, favorite, cares more for others than herself, strong spiritual belief, lives in tune with nature and strength, um, but she doubts herself. Uh, black and white beliefs, no gray areas. So, again, like Artemis. She, if you are good, you're good. If you do something out, out of step, 
you're done. And then we're talking like small steps. This is not like, oh, it's, it's not a very, very clear like, oh yeah, that was totally like a wrong step. Like it's like, no, that was like a minor, no, she's done, you're, you're done. You have one chance, you mess up at all, you're out. So. And it's unemotional and she doesn't feel the need to justify it to anybody. Wonder Woman. I get it. So here's Wonder Woman. But here's Wonder Woman in two different goddesses. You know? Um, Multiple archetypes. Clearly, she's Artemis. How is she also Isis? Because she cares for people. But she also wields justice strongly. So you can take an Artemis and an Isis as being very similar and take all of those characteristics of both goddesses and mix and match them in your character. Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter, Galadriel in the Lord of the Rings. And we have Persephone, Demir's daughter, and the maiden in the troubled teen. So, you know, have a troubled teen. <laughs> You can recognize all of these things. Um, the maiden. I mean, you just picture like a girl with flowers in her hair you sitting with a unicorn. Too, I think. Yeah. She's picking flowers. Yeah, she's like, she's yeah. So she's, she's, she's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. off the meadow when, yeah. when Hades descends and yeah. sees her and is like, oh, I must have you, and snatches her up. Yeah. yeah. She's a, a little girl. A virgin, of course. Innocent. Innocent. Gentle. Sensible. Um, commitment problems. Depends on others. Of course, she's a little bit. Needs attention. Um, the, trouble, the little girl grows up to be the troubled teen, steals, fights, is superficial, uh, likes to hurt people, hurt her. Um, so, it's, so there's a revenge aspect to it. Um, but vulnerable to influence by others. So the troubled teen, if you took like a male troubled teen, would be Pinocchio. You know? He's like, oh, look at these guys. I'm going to follow them because that looks like fun. Um, yeah, he's, he's changed from a little boy into um, somebody who hates authority, depressed, and she doesn't want to go to school. Alice in Alice in Wonderland, Dorothy the Wizard of Oz, and Daisy the Candle and Marie Gatsby. Next slide is my favorite. Yay. I brought this up. Yes. So this is something that we see in comics. Um, you also see, it, as we noticed, with all those very beautiful goddess images, men can be all sorts of types and shapes and forms and body type. And we're talking body types, but also their personality. But you can have tall, short, fat, skinny, weak, whatever. Women, we're allowed to be sexy. And that's about it. So especially when you come and start pulling in goddesses and the divine woman into fiction, you're sexy or you're a crone. That's about it. You're not allowed to be anything else. You, there's no, you're not allowed to be a fat goddess. Like, uh, was it a uh, Greek god of wine? Uh, Dionysus. Thank you, Dionysus. Big fat guy. You carry him around on the chair. There's no big fat goddess of wine. Or right? Or pan. Um, we were all, uh, the athlete. Like, what the, what's the difference between the athlete and the villainous? Between the athlete, the innocent. The innocent and the villainous, it's like just, Bigger boobs. Bigger boobs? Like, is that really the thing? Different pose. The different pose used to do her. Yeah, the yeah. vixen. Like, Fighting the athlete and the, and the innocent yeah. all have slimmer figures, less. Yeah, so if, if you are writing. I'm not much less And we're going <laughs> women of any type, but like, especially women in authority power, you know, authority positions. And you pull out your descriptions for all of them, and you suddenly realize I've just written the same type of woman physically, emotionally, over and over again, but your men are allowed to be this broad range, what's a problem? So one of the things that, um, again, I wonder when the movie brought out, my, um, I put a post up on Facebook because my daughter is refusing to go see Wonder Woman because she's a Marvel girl. She refuses to go see this movie. And my brother put a post up a, a YouTube video by this guy who reviewed the movie who is Hilarious, so funny. He's like, I'm, I'm big. I'm six foot two. I'm a guy. I like being a guy. But I'm gonna tell you, in 89% of this movie, I wanted to be Wonder Woman. <laughs> he was absolutely hilarious. But one of the things he said in the beginning was, there is a feast 
of different kinds of, I don't want to be sexist, but there is a feast of different kinds of women. There are black women, there are white women, there are brown women, there are thick women, there are skinny women. There is every kind of woman you could want on this island. And that's groundbreaking. And why? Because I'm a woman directed this film. So we want to see that similar sort of representation within the writing of short characters. Should we be short? There are some short. There are some short, 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 short women. Short women. <laughs> uh, short women. That's my favorite five. I want sure to see flat-chested <laughs> women, women who I'm like I don't have a whole lot of curves unless I go about making my clothes look like I have. I I like to joke with my mom. I'm like I'm built like a wooden plank. I just go straight down the sides. Um, but that's not what society says women are supposed to look like. So we we're always talking about their hourglass figure. Most women don't are not hourglass figure. Or the pear shape, which is still romanticized to a certain degree. Again, oh, there's plenty of women out there who are not pear shaped. So that's why in the twenties that was the one time yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Shape. yeah, right. The yeah. flapper dresses. Yeah. yeah. No no way. Yeah. yeah, one of the And that was a way that was a way of Liberating. Defeminizing. Right. Yeah. Defeminizing themselves. Yeah. Taking yes. the female out of the form. Yeah. And doing yeah. the opposite. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, it was the lack of restriction in the clothing. And mm -hmm. lines went up. You could actually move. They didn't even have to wear the first mm -hmm. thing. You could bend over. You could take yeah. the breath. Well, because, yeah, when you're strapped into the bone whale corsets and you actually can't move to the side, like, this is all you're really good for all day long. And you stood it. And then going back and you drop here. anything, you have to do like a full bend. Oh yeah, you don't even you don't even that's why you had servants. Yes. Because you drop something, you are not like you physically cannot actually go down and get it. Or if you do, you're not getting back up. Yeah. <laughs> like there's a reason why the the, the culture of all where males pull out the chair. It's because when you have the big dress, if you try to sit down, that chair is gonna get knocked out from behind you, you're gonna fall on your butt and get hurt. So men had to pull the chair for women's safety. These uh, these things evolved for a reason. Men opened the door because women were wearing gloves. The doors could be dirty. You're going to get your nice white gloves dirty. I'm a gentleman. Let me help you stay clean and pure. So you open the door for the woman. And again, the woman goes in. They got the train. The door shuts on the train. The woman's going to fall and get hurt. So you have to hold the door, make sure her clothing <laughs> is off the door. Yeah. Which hampers all ability to do. Which hampers all ability to do. What? Some interesting stories, but strangely enough, all of our superheroes have their clothing on. Well, and this is that studying of the form of like, I'm like, I wish I could read. Of course, some the, men the, the men have no clothing. The men have no clothing. I wish I could read the descriptions. Um, I would have to find it. And I'll I'll post it on my Twitter account. Um, because the descriptions for the what the men are allowed to be, where you, you're reading about their personality and how it connects to the body, and then you come and you read the description of the women and how that connects to the personality of the innocent versus the vixen versus the fighter. And they all are still required to be sexy. And it's just like, really? That's, that's what we're all, that's what we're supposed to be putting out there? Okay, yeah. So, so we want to show, we want, we want to urge people who are writing to be more creative in their use of archetypes and how you envision your characters. Um, because we are, women, just as much as men, are guilty of envisioning everybody this way, women this way, because that's all we know. So that's why things like Wonder Woman are so important, that there really was, what I, I read that, I heard that review before I saw the movie, and so I really, I don't know that I would have paid attention as much as I did. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, gosh there are some, Heavier women on this island, and they're you dark. You the nice, people. nice adult review, and I'm coming from a different <laughs> angle, which I was like, that's exactly why. And it was women are watching Wonder Woman bursting out into crying during the fight scenes. Why? Because yeah. it's the first time we're seeing ourselves represented on film, not filmed through the boner lens. <laughs> <laughs> Although, yeah, Diana still looks like that. Yes. So we still have ways to go. Diane, they were never going to cast short and right. squat and no big. They were never going to give her a full outfit. Right. <laughs> no, that was never going to happen. Yeah, but if you compare the Wonder Woman we got, look online for Joss Whedon's Wonder Woman script. It got out. Uh, somehow somebody got a hold of it and they tore it apart online. And it is the worst thing ever. So it's more like that. It is 
this. Joss Whedon wrote his fanboy fantasy of Wonder Woman. There is actually, she does an erotic dance in the script. She pulls out the line, she's talking to somebody, like telling them to like, oh, if you're gonna attack me, then be a man and like do it face my, to my face kind of thing. Wonder Woman grew up on an island of women. She has, she, one, she's not gonna say be a man because she doesn't have the concept of be a man to be powerful, but two, Women can be powerful in her world. She literally, be a man does not exist within dialogue. Would not be an idiot. Would not be an idiot. <laughs> yes. I mean, it is the worst thing ever. It is Steve's story of him lusting over Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman literally doing like a robotic dance at one point to like distract people. So like, seriously? Yeah, the whole thing. The whole script is written with the bummer lens in mind. <laughs> I thought it was really fair of the movie. I think that's one why it's so popular. Uh, well, it didn't emasculate the man right, they weren't in idiots. order to make the woman <laughs> yeah. strong. Yeah. Which, the one scene that really gets me is when they're going through the trenches and she keeps wanting to stop and help, and the guys and the yeah. are like, no, point A, point B. Like, yes. We don't have time for that. Yeah, no <laughs> and she's, been, she's like, now, yeah. and like, enough. And, and I like that because they, they were, had the best intention. But yeah, and they did the thing they were yeah. doing right, just yeah. a different perspective and equal and yeah. equal perspective. Yeah. 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 Because you were like, yeah, you really gotta keep going. <laughs> gotta go do what you gotta do. Yeah. Well, and when you pull in the female perspective into a situation, you start seeing things that are different. Talking about history, when wars happened, people got sick and they got sent off, and like limbs getting cut off because like, well, we can't fix that. It's got gangrene, whatever. Just chop it off. When they sent them off to the hospital camps that women ran, women got there and looked around and went, oh, this is dirty and cleaned. And so infection rates at those locations were much lower. People losing their limbs due to things like gangrene were lower because a woman would go, oh, we can put a bandage on it. Oh, that bandage is dirty. Let me change that and I'm gonna put a clean bandage because women like things. Yeah. That happens. That happens. Like, particularly <laughs> during the right. That happened particularly during the Civil War. There is a Civil War Medicine Museum in Frederick, Maryland, right there where I live. I found out about it a couple of years ago. I did a, a presentation on um, medicine through the ages. Um, so I did a little artist's field trip for the day to this museum. And um, that it, Frederick, the town of Frederick, was basically turned into one great big hospital. Um, they the whole t the whole town took care of all of these soldiers that came in. They built new buildings um, because the old ones were too dirty. To the women thought that the old ones were too dirty. They told them to build a new place. They kept it clean. Infection rates went down. It became known across Europe. Strangely enough, it became known across Europe as the American hospital system, which they put into practice. And after the Civil War, um, basically, the soldiers came down through D.C. and disbanded because nobody wanted to think about this war anymore. And the system was lost and came back like 50 years later as <laughs> the European system. <laughs> but it was started in Frederick, Maryland. Started and it was by started by Clinton. It was just started by well, and it, it shows the different priorities where women are like, okay, yeah, you can go roll around in the mud for a while, but like, then take a bath. <laughs> like, that's just common sense where the men are like, no, we gotta fight the war and shoot the bullets, and that's okay. It's only a flesh wound compacted with mud and feces. Like, no, we're gonna wash that out because that's crazy. Well, <laughs> so. uh, as a guy, like, you're not supposed to complain, you're not supposed to. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I'm fine. You yeah, know, right. Like, <laughs> so you get those different perspectives of the women coming in saying, no, this needs to be clean. Okay, yeah, it's wartime, but we still need to feed our children. Whereas you've got the male perspective of don't complain. Figure it out. Don't complain. Well, no, you got to complain to make, the, to make it better. Um, so, we have some infrequent news guys. In fact, there are so many mythological systems in the world. Um, that you would never run out of gods. Now, gods or goddesses to use as archetypes. Now, a lot of them are going to be similar. You know, a lot of the Greek goddesses and gods became Roman. They would just change the names. They were the same people. Um, again, with um, uh, Egyptian, there were some differences. Um, the interesting things that happen are when something that we normally associate with a male god 
is represented by a female goddess. Um, and that's where some interesting things happen in mythologies. You had to begin. As the advances. Oh, too fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so in ancient Norse, we have the goddess Hel, who was the goddess of the dead. So normally we think of um, Osiris, Hades, the Grim Reaper, these are all men um, that judge the dead. And her job in, uh, in Ragnarok, this is the Norse apocalyptic tale, is to lead an army of the dead in a ship made of the fingernails of corpses. <laughs> it's a little dark. That's gross. <laughs> yeah, we take a, long, a lot of corpses. Um, so she was nasty uh, and, and judge, <laughs> judgmental <laughs> and, um, and, and yielded justice, um, just like Osiris and Hades and all of that did. But normally, we're not allowed to be the ones that get past judgment. Or lead wars. Or lead wars. Okay. Now we have Amaterasu of Shinto faith, which is in Japan, one of very few female solar deities. So we usually have Apollo, Rei, Helios. Um, after a fight with her brother uh, Susanu, who was the god of storms in the sea, she brought an age of darkness upon the world. They, um, she retreated into a cave, and they finally, um, she finally was coaxed out, and he gave her that sword as a, as a I'm sorry. Yeah, they do the yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right. But right. Yeah, normally, goddesses are goddesses of the moon, the gentle or light. The sun is powerful. Not something that normally you're allowed to operate with. And here we have Tiamat, Babylonian, uh, goddess of salt water. So normally we have Poseidon or, or Neptune. Um, she formed the world with her consul, consul Apsu, who was the god of fresh water. Apsu was killed by the gods that Tiamat had, so their children. Uh, it sounds a lot like the Greek, you know. Um, Kids can Right, the. the, the the gods before Zeus, you know, God, Zeus's parents. Uh, uh, Titans. Titans. Um, she summoned an army of demons to fight the gods, but she then she was killed, and in death they split her corpse in two and they uh, the sky and the waters. So, so we're going to talk about cultural. Uh, this is this was this is this is my big thing. So there is a difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. And it gets a little tricky when you start pulling from mythologies that are still part of living religion. A big part of the reason why I think we see so much of the Greek and Roman mythologies, Egyptian mythologies, is because those religions are by and large dead. People who worship them, worship them as almost a resurgence. As we, yes, we, I'm not Greek, but I pray to Artemis because I, I, I appreciate that archetype and what she symbolizes, and so that's just who I choose. But you're not actually of that original faith. The religion and has take been, a lot of liberty. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, how they, how the religion has long since died. But there are still plenty of mythologies out there where the religion is still living. These are not dead gods. They are still dead goddesses. They're still alive. They're still worshipped by hundreds of millions of people. So when you get to those religions, it gets tricky because, yes, it would be cool to take this awesome goddess who represents these things and pull it in my novel, I'm gonna rewrite it, she's gonna be a teenager and there's gonna be sex, it's gonna be great. If it's a living religion, or if it's like the ab aboriginals in Australia, their gods are still living gods. So yeah, it can be great to pull from that faith, but if you are not an aboriginal person and you are pulling from a living religion, it will be as offensive to them as if you worship Jesus and they have decided to bring Jesus into the modern era Give him a boombox to put on his shoulder, and he's going to eat him. They did kind of do that concept. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's but a how fine well line. Is that, it's right. that fine line of, oh, Catholicism. Mary is a big, important figure in Catholicism, and you want to write a modern remake of Mary's story as a fantasy novel. She maybe was I was talking about the last temptation of Christ. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Big oh, yeah. Or having I'm raised Catholic, so we get here. Yeah, having having a, a character within your world see actual Mary descending, like, oh, you see, you're doing your math test, and oh, it's going to be number B. Mm -hmm. Like, it's going to be a little iffy pulling off some of that stuff. So you have to be respectful of, oh yeah, I want to take this living goddess from Shinto mythology and pull it into my fiction, or build off of that. 
at what point are you crossing into appropriation? You're stealing somebody else's faith to make money off of it. So there is a danger zone there. It's a little bit easier if you are writing and it's not our modern Earth world or historical Earth world, and what you're doing is you're taking the archetype of that goddess and you are creating a goddess that is similar, but it is not the Shinto goddess from Japan, but it is highly inspired by her for your fictional world, which is not Earth. That's a little bit easier. Then you can see, okay, cultural influence, cultural appreciation, but you didn't straight lift a goddess from communities that are not represented well within our, our genre. When you are doing that, though, go find somebody who is of that faith, who is of that culture, and say, hey, I wrote this thing. Could you? I would like you to read it. Pay them for their time. Even if, it, even if they're like, no, I don't need money, treat them for coffee, tea, lunch, so that you know you're you appreciate that they're taking their time to review it and then ask them like please call me like let me know if there's stuff I need to adjust did I totally blow it like would, is this something that would be highly offensive that I have the goddess do get that outside opinion because you may think you wrote the best thing ever and they're going to quickly be like actually no like I know you didn't mean to offend me but I'm very deeply offended and this is something, it is very similar to what what we're experiencing in, in the goddess field, and so I, what women are complaining about right now with the goddess figures being all like, so the only three monotheistic religions in the world right now are Islam, Christianity, and, and Judaism. There are hundreds of religions in this world, and they're all of the rest of them are probably all of them. Um, there is like a list. If you go on the Wikipedia page of, of religions, you mythologies, just you just can't keep scrolling. There's and a lot of them are dead. So there's there's some of the, some of the dead ones are so dead you don't know a lot about them. Um, but that gives you a lot of room for world world building. You can create things within that framework that we do have. But um, still, but it's but it's that same problem that we have with the depiction of women. Well, this is a really weird day. <laughs> we have a flash flood warning on. Yeah, yeah. I think like there's power probably, station. Yeah, there's probably power, power station. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Four yeah. plus yeah. pursuing their thesis right now. That's right, I know. <laughs> oh, no. oh no. Yeah. Um, so the same thing that's happening with women, a depiction of women, happens also with writers who are from the West who only have a monotheistic point of view. We have the idea that, oh, there are no real religions that have more than one god anymore. They're not really worshiping them, not the same way we worship them. You have to be, yes, it's the same way we worship them. Yeah. And you have to be uh, appreciative of that. Oh yeah, no, there was, um, God, there was a comedy special on Netflix that I just watched. It was the guy who does the, is it The Daily Show now, African American? Oh, mm -hmm. Trevor. Trevor, yeah. Trevor. So his new special was out on Netflix and I watched it. And he has a little thing about, can you imagine when the British first arrived in India? Yeah. And he's like, we arrived, we're all going so to funny. worship our god. And what's it, what's, which, which one? God. The one true god. Bitch god. <laughs> yeah, like, what am I supposed to do? And I go, great, please god, I want to get that. No, not you god, the other god. No, not you god, the other god behind you god. So yeah, and that is the thing. Like it, it is still a living religion with hundreds of gods. So well, some of those countries too, like in, when they tried to bring Christianity to China, yeah. there wasn't a word for the Western concept of God. Right. So they had to make this up. So when they said, "Oh, we have million Christians now," uh, other critics of the of uh, the Jesuits working there like, what, "What is their idea of God that you're talking about?" Because they don't have a word for it. So what are they worshiping? It's the same thing they're worshiping in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. When Christianity was first developed, that they took from a lot of the Celtic and, and other local yeah. polytheistic religions around mm -hmm. them and just kind of transitioned them into the Christian faith that they wanted to them to yeah. adopt instead. So which grew from the Judaic and from Judaism, Judaism which right. were the masters of absorbing yeah. everything oh, around. Yeah. So, so when you are it? when you are absorbing <laughs> from other yeah. religions yeah. for yeah. your writing, also make sure you're not just pulling the sensationalized stuff. Because whenever I see the Mayan, the Aztec, it's always the sensationalized, the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to that culture than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, those gods are dead. The people are not. There are still people, direct descendants of the Mayans and the Aztecs, and it is offensive that the only thing you can ever find about the Mayans and the, the, their gods is the worshiping and the sacrifices. These horrible blood sacrifices, those, they were, oh my god, it was so pagan of them. How could they do that? Guess what? Christians did it too. Mm-hmm. So did the, Re- the Greeks and the Romans. Sacrifice was a part of all religions. So if that's what you're sensationalizing, that's what you're adapting, again, that's appropriation and it's, it's going to be offensive. People are going to not be happy with that. I'm glad the board is still working. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we lost well, the side. Oh, we still have that. And there's there. still lights up there. And then oh, is it on a timer, maybe? Maybe. Uh, is there a button in there? Are we not moving enough? <laughs> yeah, it's on the clock. Wait. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Okay. I mean, I don't mind. Yeah, it's. But it would, who would have think it wouldn't blink like that? I know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, hall yeah. was blinking. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Hey, as long as we still have PowerPoint. Feel like the, so that's basically what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So, <laughs> it's crawling. so yeah, so I just summed up the slide but forgot to click to the slide. So yeah, how do you respect and honor women and still tell a story? And how do you respect and honor a religion and still tell a story? Um, here's the feminine journey versus the masculine journey. Oh, very similar, uh, though some strange flipping. Um, the feminine journey, and there's a much more, uh, much broader explanation of both journeys in that 45 Minutes of Characters book as well. Um, really interesting reading. It's, it, you start reading, you just kind of get sucked in. Um, but I just pulled some quick things out. So the feminine journey starts with questioning authority. Why? They have to. Because they've only accepted authority until now. So you have, to, in order to start a journey, you have to say, wait a minute, is something wrong with the way I've been living my life? Well, and especially when you live where you are owned by somebody else. Right. You are a daughter, then you are a wife. You have to stay within the house. You're not allowed to own land. At that point, yeah, you have a very limited, you can't go out and about and run, just run off willy-nilly. Right. You have to start the questioning first. So the next thing you have to do is gain courage. So this is a very slow start to a journey. First you have to question, then you have to gain courage, which requires some inner exploration, right? Um, during the journey, you're going to face death, transform, and then you are then in charge of your own destiny. The masculine journey starts in charge of his own destiny. So the first thing he has to do is gather allies and tools. He's been called to a, he's been called to a task. He get, he says, okay, God, do the task. There's no questioning because this is what he was bred to do. This is what he was born to do. This is what he's always been told that he has to do. Set out toward his goal. Reject inner explanation. <laughs> There's no need for it. Um, and really, in the masculine journey, the allies are the ones who provide that inner explanation for him. Um, that's why he needs allies in, in it to give him that feedback that the woman has to suffer herself. The feminine has to suffer. That's where, within fiction, within movies especially, you'll see the manic pixie dream girl come in to help provide the guy with, we need to explore your emotions and the inner right. workings, which is a trope that I am usually <laughs> objective to. And then the next two are the same. He has to face death. And death doesn't have to be real death. It can be a, a, a dark soul moment. Yeah, yeah. dark and soul. Transform. Transformation is the same. And then you have questions. <laughs> At the end. Um, Oh, yeah, I'm gonna hit it. I'm gonna okay. hit it. Okay. So masculine and feminine doesn't have to mean male and female. Same thing as in a rela- in a relationship, there's always a masculine and a feminine. Not necessarily is the masculine the male or the feminine the female. This is a men's magazine. So when you look at this, you're like, oh, look at how sexy Hugh Jackman is. This is what women want to see. Objectify. This is a men's magazine. Yeah. Women did not objectify him to be this. This is what men want to see. This is Hugh Jackman on a women's magazine. This is what women want to see. He looks like he could bake me a cupcake and ice it. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. With the gentle kiss on my cheek. Yeah. He's going to give me like a foot massage. We're going to have some hot cocoa in front of the fire and we're going to snuggle and snuggle might lead to something else. But yeah, this. Red rage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to snuggle with him. He does not look friendly. He looks like he's been out drinking. 
I'm going to have to lock that door. Please don't come home. You need to go spend the night at your brother's house. This guy, I want to come. And that's the same guy. That's the same guy. Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> so there's definitely Photoshop going on there, but there is the... Balance version. Yeah, but there is the... When, when people talk about, well, men are objectified too. Look at Wolverine and look at the superheroes with the, the men with the super tight suits. No, those were, you're objectifying that man with a power fantasy for your vision. Women. Well, it's also objectifying men in the sense that, so every man now has to be that skinny. It, no, it totally, and out, it totally you know, is, but it's different than sexualizing a woman for us because they are, they are objectifying the man for men. Well, I, men I are think the other thing we have this. to be careful of is that it's not just men objectifying women or women objectifying men. It's men objectifying men, women objectifying for women. For sure. For, for what we've been taught is what we should look like yeah. or act like. I was having a conversation with my husband recently and I've been talking about remembering back in high school and as you're going through puberty and your body's changing and you're figuring everything out and evaluating your friends and kind of comparing them and that, you know, you always have in the back of your head a bit of a hierarchy, like of all my friends, this one's a previous, this is the next previous. And you're just like this aware of that. Yeah. And he was floored. He's like, that's horrifying. That is awful. I have never thought of my friends that way. I have never broken it down that way. I've never judged them on those values. Like that's that's awful that you guys did that and had to do that for each other and that that's that like he was just it hurt him deeply that there was this culture that that women judged each other on that level and, and, and went through life that way. He just had never realized that that existed and hated the concept when he heard it and was just astounded by it. And I was like, yeah, ask any high school girl. Well, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, like, if you're going, like, okay, I know that I'm prettier than Sandra, but I know that I'm less prettier than Elizabeth. Like, you, you we're, yeah. we're not doing it just to objectify them. You're like, oh, I know. I'm, like, no, we're placing ourselves within that system. So, like, I know where I fit in, where my rank is, according to what society says I'm supposed to be, and how closely I can get to that. So. Well, I teach middle school, and a lot of times with disputes, with um, when girls have a dispute, a lot of times like I'm passing the baton on this one. Especially <laughs> middle school age. Yeah, oh it's my gosh. Oh, yeah. Ration is not yeah. ration has left the building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. rational yeah. thought is asking mm -hmm. too much. Let's like say we're holding them until they become human. Yeah. Yes. Put them back out there. Yeah. Yeah. And yes. thank you very much for the eight hours you're holding. So we're going to put a list of um, resources that we found while we were researching this up on the in your right mind Facebook page. Um, or you can, yeah, Facebook group. There's a Facebook group. A Facebook group. Yeah. But, um, did you guys either be you or you familiar with uh, David Levy's book, The Great Goddess? Uh, he's a mythology yeah, writer. He's like not quite Joseph Campbell, but he's written right. a lot about various mythologies. And I use one of his textbooks for my myth class, oh. uh, and it examines a lot of those not lesser goddesses that you talked about, the lesser great right. ones. Uh, and he's got apparently an entire book that talks about the goddess archetypes and matriarchal pre-myth culture before we've got male myths. I haven't read that portion of the book, but um, I've heard the parts from the textbook I use, and um, it's on my list of when I have more money to buy books. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, David Leeming, L-E-E-M-I-N-G, and I think that one's called The Great Goddess. If you want Netflix, as a four episode documentary yeah. that I tell everybody about, the Ascent of Women. It's four episodes on Netflix, and it gives you, it's basically the history of women and why why these archetypes built. Why, why like, how did bailing laws come about? And like, why is that a thing? Why was it significant for women? Why was it good? Why was it bad? It really is the history of women, and it gives you a better insight into why, why the world acts so ways about women now that it does. Like, this was not, these were not, Oh, these cultural norms that we have now, they didn't just spontaneously happen 25 years ago. We're going back thousands and thousands of years. The first veiling law on record they know about is 2,000 years before Islam and Christianity existed. So, and it had nothing to do with religion, but it was a status thing. So, the fact that it is now so attributed to religion and to religions that the Western culture view very negatively, and that we were like, no, those, those women wearing veils are primitive and rip the veil off and be free. And if you're choosing to be like that, you're choosing to be oppressed. No, at this point, they are choosing it for them. Like, you let them choose it for themselves. We are forced into the veil. Women across the world were forced into the veil for thousands of years. 
and now you're trying to strip it off again. It's the patriarchy coming in and saying, no, this is what I want this woman to be. So like, let us, it's a very interesting documentary. And it go, I mean, it goes way beyond the veil. It talks about um, one of the first goddess figures out there, the city woman from Anatoly. And the figurine is not a smooth, sexy woman. She's big, thunder thighs, and Flappy pancake boobs. Well, for, and forever and oh, ever, yeah. that's indicated that fertility. Is the, that yeah. is the fertility yeah. goddess. But by modern standards, you look at that and you're like, that's an ugly female. What? <laughs> that was the peak. That was what women, that was the peak of what women were supposed to be. We were supposed to be the fertility goddess. And things shifted and changed, and now, who knows? But we are out now of time. Now we know what it Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of time. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Learn something. Reach out if you need anything. Have anything to offer or anything?